Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Gossels, the Artistic Director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to the fifth annual Boston Israeli Film Festival. The seven full length and five short films we are showing represent some of the most exciting cinema produced in Israel today, including out of film schools. I hope you've enjoyed the films and conversations we've presented thus far, and that you'll get to see The Narrow Bridge and Matchmaking, the two other films we're streaming through Wednesday, March 29th. The Boston Israeli Film Festival is made possible through the generous support of the Fine Family Foundation, Massachusetts Cultural Council, Combined Jewish Philanthropies, our friends at the Consulate General of Israel to New England, and you, our pass holders and ticket buyers. Thank you for sticking around for what should be a fun and illuminating conversation with Idan Chaguel, the immensely talented writer and director of Concerned Citizen, moderated by Amir Ted Moore, Head of Cultural Affairs at the Consulate General of Israel to New England. Boston Jewish Film and the Israeli Consulate in Boston have a very long-standing partnership that dates well before our first Israeli film festival. Welcome, Amir and Idan. Hello. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Hi it's Lisa. great seeing you both. Great to see you too. Um, Amir, you've been in your role for almost three years, um, and I want to thank you personally and professionally for being such a joy to collaborate with. I know you've seen Concerned Citizen many times, and how much Idan's film resonates with you. Idan, your film premiered at the 2022 Berlin International Film Festival and has garnered five awards at least, including Best Script and Best Original Score at the 2022 Jerusalem Film Festival. I've seen Concerned Citizen twice and loved it on both viewings. It's part social commentary and part social satire. I care deeply about the people I met in your film and the issues your film addresses. I appreciated your casting choices and how naturalistic and authentic the film feels. We're honored to be screening it in our festival, and I know we're all very much looking forward to your conversation with Amir. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Right. Um, thank you, Lisa, for inviting me. I'm extremely honored to be here again. And first, I would uh, like to acknowledge the dedicated uh, team of Boston Jewish Film. Um, who worked tirelessly to bring the Boston Israeli Film Festival to life for the fifth time uh, with fabulous lineup and programming. And uh, the Israeli concert is proud of having supported uh, Boston's Jewish and Israeli film festivals. And we are grateful for the partnership and friendship, of course, with you. And Shalom Idan. Uh, it's a pleasure to finally meet you uh, virtually. Uh, preparing for the this Q and A, as uh, Lisa mentioned, I watched Concerned Citizen for the first for the fourth time, um, wow. and uh, I agree with my friend, the film critic Avner Shavit, who wrote that it is one of the best Israeli films in recent years. It uh, simply shines every time, and every time differently. Um, so the film touches uh, social issues like uh, privilege uh, and hierarchy, human rights, uh, gentrification and police brutality in a sophisticated and nuanced way. Um, I wanted to ask you, how did the script come to be and evolve over time? And does it reflect your own life experiences? Well, the script started to, first off, thank you for uh, the lovely words and uh, appreciation. It's uh, very humbling. Um, the script started when um, I, I moved, I myself moved into this neighborhood in South Tel Aviv, Neve uh, seven years ago. And um, in the first few months living there, I... Uh, became a witness to a police brutality uh, arrest, a very brutal arrest, and it kind of surprised me. It was in the middle of the night. I woke up uh, in the middle of the night and saw uh, that uh, arrest, and um, it started to haunt my uh, my thoughts for a long time, for almost a, a year and a half, and then I started to think maybe I should... Uh, should do something with it, with that feeling, with the thing I saw. And it was very, uh, 
very non-scripted the way I started with it. I just wanted to, I, I was sure I wanted to uh, uh, reflect how I felt about what I saw. And um, it took a while. It took almost a year until I uh, started to uh, place that event into a, 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 a storyline. And uh, slowly things started to gather together. Things that uh, I saw in the neighborhood, things that I felt, uh, a lot of personal experience that I manipulated into the story. Um, so it formed very naturally, uh, I think. Um, and then uh, I had like almost, I had like a, a, a start, beginning and an end. And then uh, at some point I started to uh, to shoot the film independently. And then after six and a half shooting days, I stopped because of budget. And um, by the time I returned, uh, by the time we started shooting again, it took almost 10 months. So in those 10 months, I constantly rewrote the script while watching footage of the first days of shooting. So I, I already had like um, understood the strength of uh, the acting, the actors, uh, what I liked about the dialogue, dialogue that worked, what scenes I liked, what scenes I didn't like so much. And then I started rewriting uh, again and again during editing, which is kind of basically the way you almost do a documentary. Uh, not a feature film because feature films usually you write a script you go shoot the script and then if you need another scene or something like that then you get a little bit of money and, and do one or two scenes but for this film it was like almost half or more than half of the film was shot after so I um, it was basically a little bit like a, a documentary I had the thing in editing and I knew uh, I knew what I, I needed to add to it to make it stronger or or more uh, more dramatic or more funny or uh, whatever. So that's the way it formed. So it was constantly re rewritten and rewritten again and again and again, and, and also in the editing room. So you mentioned the budget issues as well. Uh, what were some other challenges that uh, you faced during? Uh, while working on the film other challenges i had many challenges uh, working on this film uh, by the nature of i think every film is very very challenging uh, to make um, i think in maybe in, i don't know other countries but in israel usually the budget is in israel is never enough from what i hear uh, from other filmmakers i i I only made uh, uh, independent films so far. So uh, I knew how to make an independent, I know what it takes to make an independent film, um, how tough it is. But but this time it was like uh, one of the, the hardest things was also one of the, the bigger blessings in the film because the hardest thing was to stop for 10 months and 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 then keeping the group together and reforming after 10 months, which is very hard because film is one of the most important things about film is continuity. You need people to look the same. You need an actor to walk out of a scene and go back into another scene and look the same. And when you take a risk and stop the shooting for 10 months, it's a risk. It's a, something could happen. So, uh, on one hand, I had like material from the the first part of the shooting, and I knew it was strong. I liked it very much, and I felt like there was something there. But at the same time, there was that risk that the film will not be finished after ten months. It could not happen. So that was a very stressful uh, period of time, uh, and there were other challenges. Uh, but uh, I think uh, this one was the biggest one. Mm as far as making it. Mm -hmm. uh, the cast features many new faces. Uh, the actors who play Ben and Roz, 
uh, who had been generally anonymous before, uh, but also actors like Lena Freifold, who plays Raza's best friend and also stars in Valeria is Getting Married, which is screened at this festival as well. Can you talk about the casting choices? Well, <clears throat> I was kind of looking for people uh, I don't know, to discover, not really discover, but the main, the main, um, the main uh, motivation for me was to believe what I'm seeing. So, in order for me to believe, I need to see people who are uh, not associated with the. Uh, with other roles. So uh, I was kind of looking out for people that are uh, excited me that I didn't know about, obviously very talented, but uh, uh, so it was, um, for me, I just went into to theater shows. I went into the Fringe Theater of Israel and uh, I saw a few Fringe uh, shows and and just approached people that I really, really liked. That was like, uh, I knew I knew Ariel from uh, theater. And I talked with him and from Ariel, I, I uh, reached also Shlomi. And Shlomi and Ariel are also a, a couple in real life. So so that was one of the my main goals. I, I really wanted a couple in... Uh, in the film i wanted that intimacy i wanted to again to believe what i see and um and lena i saw in one of ariel's plays called uh, uh, oedipus uh, uh he made an adaptation of oedipus and uh i saw lena there and i saw shlomi there and uh, when i saw lena i was very very excited also and uh, i casted her to the to the role in the film, and uh, it was her for first feature film. She never done a film before that, and um, and many of the actors there. I think it was their first uh, film. Uh, maybe they did shorts, but they never did a feature film. So um, it was very exciting to get to these people, and I had a. I'm very proud that of the casting in the film it's because it's very uh it's very fresh i think and also usually in israel and in other parts of the world usually people cast people who are known already and uh, they don't want to take a risk hmm. because uh, there's a budget and then they think about marketing and usually they're right because people go wherever they see familiar faces but this time my ambition as a director and writer was also to create a world that is um feels believable in some ways because and if there was like a big name there it would throw you out of the world it would uh, mm. that was my thesis anyway and uh, i'm not necessarily right but i think it was uh, at that point in time that was my mindset mm. yeah, there's there is a lot to be said about the symbolism uh, of the tree planting. Uh, when Ben plants it at the beginning, it leads to places we couldn't imagine um, uh, in the plot. Uh, it can evoke, for example, uh, Karen Kayemet Israel, the Jewish organization that has acquired, acquired land and planted trees since the 20th century. What was your intention in, in giving it such a prominent voice in your film? Um, when you, your initial intentions are not usually uh, symbolic, it's not like I wasn't looking for symbols when I when I uh, had the story idea, but once you think about the idea. It becomes symbolic also. There's a lever, a layer of symbolism. And then when you're aware of it, there is like an amount of amount of awareness that is good uh, as a, uh, in the film. And I think I'm very careful with the awareness thing because if I would constantly think about the Karen Kayemet element and the Zionist element of the tree, 
I would probably go lost with the metaphor and I would probably go too much into it. I think it would kind of ruin the the story. It's 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 uh, it's there. It's uh, people can feel it. You don't need to do so much about it. It's it's obvious. Like there's a historical meaning in the Israeli mythology of of uh, Israel about planting a tree, but but uh, for the main character, it's it's uh, it's not perceived as as that. He's just it's very simplistic for him. He's, he moved into this neighborhood. He plants this tree in the neighborhood. He wants the the neighborhood to look a little better. And then the film, uh, there is an element of uh, interpretation and thought into that that the audience is there also to to give to the film. And the film doesn't need to be uh, always meta and always talking about itself. There's the audience there, and it's a very big element of the film. And you need to, I think, personally, you need to leave a freedom uh, to the audience and uh, allow him to think for itself. And uh, you don't need to do much with a metaphor. You just need to uh, to hint a little bit because... Uh, the main the main thing about the story is is the story itself you don't the symbolic things in it are blooming once the story is working i think if the story wouldn't work then it would be like just uh, an empty symbol i think mm. um, many... obviously, obviously yeah, it's sorry. there obviously it's there obviously it was in my thoughts uh uh there is like a, there is a, a, an element of uh, of Zionism, uh, a Zionist act in what he does. And um, when I uh, went to film school, I took a course in, uh, in uh, Zionist films, and I saw many propaganda Zionist propaganda films. And uh, there's always there's always this connection with the land, this erotic. A spiritual connection with the land so uh, I always find it a little bit comical once you see these uh, propaganda films now it's 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 uh, ludicrous to see those films but uh, but still they're in they're in the mythology of the state of Israel so uh, it was in my thoughts but I didn't give it too much uh, emphasis because I didn't want to take control of the story um, many LGBTQ plus themed films, uh, both narrative and documentary, are being produced uh, and screened in Israel every year. And here you present a naturalistic LGBTQ story with the the elements of identification, privilege, etc., in a realistic and authentic way. Uh, what were the reaction to? the film throughout Israel? Um, I've get, I get asked that question, what is the reaction a lot? And uh, I don't really know apart from reviews and the people around me, the people that approach me and talk with me. The people who approach me and talk with me obviously are very positive. And uh, and the reviews were were very good. So uh, from my point of view, whatever I experienced, it was a very good response. But I guess maybe there are people that uh, didn't take it so well and were uh, kind of annoyed. Maybe I hope mm. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. I I think uh, no, I'm just joking. I don't hope. But it's like uh, I think it was a, a generally good a general good response. But um, um, also, I, I always, I, not always, but I, I got a few responses of people that felt that the couple uh, reflect uh, ref reflect their life choices, maybe, and uh, they felt kind of bad about it. It was horrifying for them to see themselves in some way um, uh, reflected on a screen. And uh, they didn't like the main characters because because it reflected something in them and their lifestyles and some of the things the the, the main characters say they also say and it kind of 
it, it, usually people with uh, humor, self humor, uh, who can criticize themselves, were um, very positive about the film. Uh, but yeah, but my general, um, my uh, my first uh, goal was to make a film about gay people without addressing the usual uh, narrative of gay films and um uh i wanted the film to address uh gay people that i saw around me and also in the reality of that neighborhood which is not uh which is which is not a reality of a person who is coming out to his family or you know what I, you know what i mean like there there's a few narratives in gay cinema that are more uh, popular to say you know popular but uh, i felt like i wanted to give something else like to feel to have a, a different angle on the gay community and to be completely honest about it and uh, so i think that honesty was uh, appreciated from what i felt yeah and and in your film the couple are trying to have a baby through surrogacy and and actually my clearly criticizes the process in a way mm -hmm. um depicting it is a uh, pragmatic and somewhat sterile and mechanical um can you comment on that did you have any any experiences or stories from friends that um influenced the story uh no it was more in a political environment around surrogacy i think that sparked the idea and also uh research i basically talked with people who did it asked them how they felt what was the pro procedure uh, i talked with a uh an agency and uh, you know it was basically a research uh and i i based everything on facts that i heard but it was uh wrapped in the dilemma the moral dilemmas that i had about this procedure because obviously as a gay man i contemplate parenthood and uh, this is one of the ways to become a parent in israel so i was uh, having moral dilemmas about it and somehow it it fitted the theme of the film and I, I, it was my uh i tried to to incorporate it into the main storyline uh yeah. But uh, everything was based on fact, and everything was um, everything was taken to the the realistic extreme. I didn't try to um, I didn't want it to uh, become too kitsch. Um, it's not about saying yes to surrogacy or no to surrogacy. It's about this is surrogacy. Mm. Yeah. Um. It then says the film premiered in Berlin last year. It was screened in dozens of film festivals and received, as you mentioned, fantastic reviews and won several awards. Actually, last week, year I was honored to receive uh, an award uh, on your behalf, the best international film at the Mystic Film Festival in Connecticut. Um, how has the film's... Uh, uh, success resonated uh, with you and um, and also has it changed your perspective on the film the, uh, has the success of the film changed my perspective on the film yeah obviously yeah because um before the film went out to the world uh, for me the film was uh i vowed i would never make a film again to my friends and I um, I said like this was too exhausting it was too terrible too much hard work I'm not gonna do this again and then the film was uh premiered in the Berlinale and the journey began and and I was like I was reminded that uh, I'm also kind of a, in my own way an entertainer and I also go on I I'm I'm not a singer and I'm not a actor and I I don't have an immediate applause to what I do, but it, it's kind of a a prolonged like effect. Uh, it's uh, I don't know if prolonged is the right word, but 
it's it's a delayed effect of applause maybe that's the right word because uh it takes you four years to complete a film and you think about an audience but you kind of forget about it in the process because you try to be authentic and you get carried away with everything about the filmmaking and then you completely forget about the moment that it will reach an audience or someone or and then um and then my uh, ego started to <laughs> get a, a little bit of a, you know, I, I got an ego stroke. And then uh, and then I said, like, OK, maybe I'll make another film. So this is like the way it changed my perspective. At first, it was like, I'm never going to make anything. And now I'm I'm thinking about it in a positive way because uh, I kind of forgot already how difficult and uh, the process was. And I'm now delusional about how nice it would be to make another film now. It would probably be better and things like that. And it's all because of the response. If it was, if the response was very, very, uh, very bad, I probably wouldn't. Uh, it would probably take me a longer time to entertain the thought of making another film. Mm. Are so. you working on a new project right now? Yeah, I'm kind of writing it still. Yeah, I am. Right. Um, we just learned this week, um, and uh, we're wrapping up soon. So uh, that we just learned that after a long uh, hiatus, the Boston Pride Parade is going to be returning this year, um, and the uh, the Tel Aviv Pride didn't stop even during COVID, um. I, my question is, what does the Tel Aviv Pride Parade mean to the community there, and why it was so important for you to uh, to film there? Um, the Pride Parade um, means all sorts of things, and it means different things from year to year. It's been going on a long time. Uh, obviously, the beginning of the Pride Parade had a very was an, an urgency to it, and uh, it was more political and it was more uh, brave, probably. And then there was a time where I think uh, we all took it for granted a little bit, and it became very commercial and it was like just a reason to party, I think. And uh, I think now the Pride Parade probably has a because of the political situation in Israel, I think the Pride Parade is now more, uh, it became urgent again, I think. It becomes more uh, more important to, to march. Um, so it's, it reflects the times, I think. Uh, um, for me, the Pride Parade is not something I usually, I'm, I'm kind of uh, shy away from uh, parades. And uh, I don't like to be uh, uh, to be in such crowded situations, but uh, but I think this year is very important, so I'll probably go. And uh, in the film itself, the Pride Parade is used as a way to show the character becoming separate from uh, its world. I think uh, because what he what he has done. And the thoughts he starts to uh, cultivate in his soul and his mind are are uh, are uh, slowly separating him from his uh, his surroundings. And one of his uh, surroundings is also the political surroundings of the gay pride parade. I hope to, to see you uh, in Tel Aviv uh, on this year's pride. I will be there definitely. And um, that's it. I'll um, return the stage to Lisa. And thank you so much, Idan. Thank you so much, Amir. Thank you. Thank you, Amir and Idan, for an amazing conversation. Um, oh, we lost <laughs> um, Idan. OK, Amir. Yes. OK, we'll do that again. Um, Thank you, Amir and Idan, for an amazing conversation that really deepened our understanding of Concerned Citizen. And Idan, everything I felt about your film's authenticity and realism came through in everything you shared about your process. And it was really moving um, 
to 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 learn how deep this story is for you and that it came in many ways from personal experience. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, to all of you listening in, um, please tell your friends that there's still time to see Concerned Citizen and Matchmaking and the Narrow Bridge through Wednesday, March 29th. And you can do that by checking out our website for this festival, bostonisraelifilm.org. And to stay in touch about our year-round programming, please sign up for our newsletters at bostonjfilm.org. Um, thank you again for tuning in and again to Amir and Idan for your time today. And I hope to see everyone soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.